Happy Tuesday, Raider Nation. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. And if you're watching us on video, brought to you by our good friends at BetUS, where you can get 150%. 150%. Where are you going to get that? You're going to get that from us, from Mo and Scott. And the great folks at BetUS, 150% deposit bonus uh, on your first $2,000. Come bet with us. And then guess what? You do that up to $2,000, you get 50% boost. It's amazing. So go check it out. Use the code YouTube150. Again, that is YouTube150. That's how you get the deal. That's the only way you get the deal. Make sure you use that promo code uh, and you'll be able to do that. So start playing today. All right. We are back. Uh, Scott Branson, uh, along with Mo Moten here on Silver and Black today. Make sure you follow Mo. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. Oh, I'm so choked up because I got to see him for the first time in a few days. So um, <laughs> make sure you follow him at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. Uh, also, you can catch him on TNT Sports on True TV, as well as he is the Raiders columnist up at SportsNot.com, where I also work, and you can catch my work up there, mostly video, and follow me also on X.com. LV Gully and the show is SNB Today. Welcome back. All right, Mo. Uh, haven't had a chance to talk to you since the game. I'm sure you had a lively Bleacher Report live as as Murph and I had a lively post-game show, our BetUS live post-game reaction show. Uh, but uh, this is uh, where we're at with the Raiders. The Raiders are in bad bad spot. They're in a bad spot. They don't have a quarterback. Aiden O'Connell, if you haven't heard, which I'm sure most of you have, is out four to six weeks with a fractured thumb which he hit on another player as he threw the ball uh, in the first half against the Rams uh, on Sunday. So he's gone. So now you have Gardner Minshew, who had a horrible game, four turnovers, as we know, three interceptions and the lost fumble. And uh, you have Carter Bradley behind him. And my guess is the Raiders will be signing or bringing in another quarterback or two uh, as, as an emergency situation. Yes, Jacoby Myers was the emergency quarterback on Sunday, Mo. And he was ineligible to play because he was not active. But um, there's a black hole at quarterback, Mo. We're going to get into some of the issues today. I want to talk also about uh, uh, the coaching situation and this team overall and where it's at. But give me your first impression. Uh, I know you've I've been seeing you interact online with folks. People are offering a lot of excuses for certain individuals and certain things that are happening. But really, it's about resume on the grass, isn't it? It's about resume on the grass, uh, and it's about you are what your record says you are, and the Raiders are a two and five football team right now. Uh, not not a very good football team. Of course, they have a laundry list of injuries, and I understand that. Um, but you're not going to, and I'm going to say this again, the one thing that Antonio Pierce needs at this point if they're not going to win football games are competitive losses. There are no moral mm-hmm. victories in football. I'm, I'm – I'm the last person that cares about moral victories. And I know Antonio Pierce has had a questionable decision late in that game. But he needs his team to be competitive. The one thing that I can say about this football team is they haven't quit on him yet. Correct. Because because that defense played pretty well, played well enough to win the football game, despite the offense turning the ball over four times, including three times before the lap, the final drive when Garner Mitchell throws that pick. But when you're looking at this Raider team now, and I said this last week, it's all about development at this point. Where The Raiders are not sniffing the playoffs. So you're looking at, okay, and I asked this question on Monday, is the, can Antonio Pierce build a coaching staff that could develop a young quarterback and a young offense? Because Brock Bowers, let's be honest, is the focal point of this offense right now yep. that Devontae Adams is in New York. You're going to bring in a quarterback. You're going to probably bring in a wide receiver. You're probably going to bring in a running back. So you're going to have a bunch of young guys on that side of the ball. And Antonio Pierce, as you know, Scott, former linebackers coach, defensive-minded head coach. If you're not making the play calls, you have to be able to identify a good coordinator, a quality coordinator, the brilliant coordinators of the world. If you look at the Harbaugh's, that's what they've done well with their coaching staffs. And that's what Antonio Pierce is going to need to do. So this period going forward, I'm looking at Antonio Pierce as a decision-maker more than I'm looking at the X's and O's. Correct. And, and this is the point I made uh, because there are people, and this goes for players. We saw it with Derek Carr. We saw it with other other people, John Groot. It doesn't matter who it is. There are people who are fans, and I, and I don't have any problem with that, And and but they will defend a player, a coach, an individual, I don't know, whoever, uh, till the death, even when that individual is culpable for some of it. And in this case, you talked about it, and we talked about this 
on Thursday, did we not? We said, listen, hey, we don't expect Antonio Pierce to win 10 games. I know a lot of you thought he would. I never thought that. Mo never thought that. And that's okay. I don't. I, that's not a reason to get fired. I'm not also advocating that they fire Antonio Pierce now. Absolutely not. But as I said on Sunday night, Mo, I believe the decision-making that I've seen from him as a head coach has been pretty bad. And I don't have any faith right now. He could change my mind. We all can change our mind because people can prove us wrong. And I'd be, I'd be fine with it. But as of right now, I don't see how, how he survives going into next year because it's not just about losing. It's not just about the offensive coordinator. Now, that's a huge part of it. Don't get me wrong. Yes, he doesn't have a quarterback. Yes, you mentioned injuries. Look at the Rams. How many injuries did they have? They weren't a very good football team, okay? And the Raiders still couldn't really compete with them. Yeah, they tried to make it close at the end, and we'll get into decision-making in a second. But for all of you who want to defend Antonio Pearson, give all these excuses – it, it just doesn't, it doesn't float with me. And I got people calling me a racist. I got people telling me I don't know this and I don't know that. I don't like his culture. BS. Get out of here. It's resume on the grass. It has nothing to do with that. So all those people who want to throw that kind of stuff, I think are just diluting the conversation because they don't want to have the truth. You asked the question, do you trust the staff? I asked Murph the other night, Mo, and I want to get your opinion on this too. Outside of maybe Scott Turner, who I think has some ability you look at the rest of that offensive staff, they're all retreads. There is nobody on there who you could trust with a young quarterback. So you're talking not about just getting rid of your offensive coordinator, but you got to have a whole new offensive staff. And by the way, I'll add to your question, my friend, do you trust Antonio Pierce to be able to get a top quality offensive coordinator in? Now, well, he, he almost had Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah, I almost dated a supermodel. Doesn't matter. I never did. So the idea that, that he can somehow reach into that bag and find a golden gem. I just don't buy it yet. And that, that was the premise of my question, because if you're looking ahead and let's say Antonio Pierce does keep his job. And I say this about all CEO or defensive minded head coaches, their most important hire is the offensive coordinator. Cause that guy is solely responsible, not solely, but mostly responsible for the development of your quarterback in that offense. And if you make the wrong decision, that could cost you your job within yes. like two years. And we see it all the time. You pick the wrong quarterback, or you pick the wrong coordinator, you're in trouble. So this is Antonio Pierce is going to have to look into his network, whoever the whoever it is. And I don't know, as you mentioned, a lot of people want to bring up. He almost had Cliff Kingsbury, and I and I understand that. But Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury is now in Washington. Okay, what is your next pitch? Yeah. What is the next thing? Like we we can't we can't dwell on the Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury situation a year later. No, you have to look ahead and say, okay, who else is in his network? Who else would he have on his short list? And okay, if his first option isn't available, is his second, third option good enough for this football team? Right, and and that's that's where the rub is. And again, I want to make this clear for those of you looking for um, just Discord or whatever. I'd love for Antonio Pierce to prove me wrong. I just don't think I will be. I don't see anything through seven weeks that shows me he's a good game manager, that he makes good decisions on the field. And we talked about it, and I, I don't know where he goes from here. He has Marvin Lewis as the assistant head coach. What is Marvin Lewis doing? Is Marvin Lewis giving this some advice? Is he giving him advice and he's ignoring it? I don't know. Because even, and I, I was getting passionately into discussions with people online, Mo, about that decision to kick the field goal at the end of the game. Well, the offense sucked, and, and he said at the press conference, well, if we wouldn't have got the penalty, we would have gone. So it's nine yards instead of four, and that's going to change your mind. So you rather, you rather score the three, kick the ball off, give the Rams the opportunity to run from the 30-yard line at the very least, and then try to have your offense, which you say you couldn't trust from nine yards, go 60, 70, whatever yards to score? Like, that's not a good football decision. In football, you have to play field position. That's part of the game. Okay, and I get it. The offense in Minshew sucked. No question. I'm not arguing that. But these dis it's not like this is the only decision, right? This is these are kind of things we see we've seen in almost every single game this season. You're right, Scott. And and I'll say the there a lot of people say there hasn't been any consistency on the fourth down calls. The consistency I see is for better or worse, Antonio Pierce completely trusts his defense in these situations a lot more than his offense. And a lot of people say for good reason, the defenses play a lot better than the offense, but there are times where you have to play into, you have to understand situational football. 
So in that situation, the Raiders, you kick the field goal, you still have to score a touchdown, mm -hmm. right? So you're not really, <laughs> you're not really, regardless of what happens after that drive, you still have to get down the field and score. You still have to trust, eventually trust your offense to score six points, which there is did not do on Sunday. They right. Kick five field goals. So it, it, it boils down to, okay, you trust your defense. We can clearly see that. But eventually, you have to put the ball in, the, unfortunately, the quarterback's hands who threw four picks and say, we need we need a touchdown. And if you're that close, when you're that close to score, you, you kind of have to take a shot. I mean, what do you have to lose? You're a two and four team anyway. What do you have to lose? You might as well go for it if you're that close because now when you get the ball back and you're on the other side of the field and the opponent side of the field, you don't trust your team to get nine yards. How can you trust your team to drive 50, 60 yards down the field to score six points anyway? Right, because to me, and again, it's really simple. I understand. Well, Minshew wouldn't have done it anyway. Yeah, but you're saying you trust Minshew to go 60, 70 yards? Right. When they can't put, they can't get first downs? They can't put together really good drives and get into the red zone? So you're already there. And to me, if you trust your defense that much, then you go for it. And you don't get it that's fine the rams have the ball at the nine let's say you trust your defense so much and they were they were great on sunday you trust your defense and you're on the nine you get three and out you're going to get the ball back around midfield now i rather have and with a return who knows maybe you get it to the 40. now you're already in a position where this field is 40 yards long and not 70. okay so this is something that you just see and and if you watch people i know a lot of people in nfl media now don't like to call out coaches because everybody's buddies but you listen to some of these coaches and what they say and what they were talking about yesterday after this this play, most of them will say, yeah, no, that's not statistically, nor is it a good field position um, um, uh, strategy. It's just not. And we've seen this numerous times this year. So you look at this and you start to say, okay, again, we've seen consistently bad decision making, not just one. If it was just one, you know, everybody makes a coach, especially if he's a new coach. Okay, fine. You make mistakes. We talked about it all year round. I just don't have any faith, Mo. I just don't see him getting to the point where he's going to get this team uh, uh, where they can be a competitive team. For some reason, I don't know why. Yes, injuries, not his fault. Yes, the quarterback throwing four turnovers, not his fault, technically. But at the same time, this is a team that doesn't look very focused to me. Do you think they look very focused? I mean, defense, they do for the most part. There's a couple guys, and we can you guys all know their names, who don't look like they're all bought in. But the rest of them, they're, they're working their tails off. It's not a lack of effort, but focus and effort and discipline are much different things. My, my issue isn't focus or effort. I mean, you can look at the game and, and tell what – sunk the Raiders ship on Sunday. It was, and then yeah. 23 said it in the post game, it was penalties and turnovers. Right. <laughs> the Raiders had 11 penalties and they turned the ball over, you know, four times. Gardner mentioned through a bunch of picks. He took onus for that. The press conference says it's un unacceptable and unfair for his teammates. If you just take away one of the turnovers, the fumble that turned into a touchdown for the Rams, this is probably a different football game. Yes. Uh, now, while, while we talk a lot about Antonio Pierce, Gardner Minshew has to be better with the football. Oh. You, there's no way you're in, you're in the league for six years and you turn the ball over that many times, and 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 have a shot to, and still have a shot to win the football game. By the way, and that's yeah. a, again that's a kudos to to the defense. But for me, for me, looking at this game, turnovers and penalties. Right, and Minshew, I don't understand. I mean, listen, he had he has as many interceptions right now through seven games as he had through seventeen last year. And he's like, I don't understand. I've never had this many turnovers. Well, why? Like, what's the why here? Is it, is it, listen, I know he's a career backup. I'm not, no one thought that Gardner Minshew was going to come in here and be some kind of savior. Okay. But when you fall off that badly, what is it? You know, what is it? Is it because the system he's confused by it and he, and he feels rushed? In? I don't know what it is. Like, I, I think that the, the Raiders need to ask the question, why can't this offense? And I think we know some of the answer there, which is Luke Getze. It doesn't seem like like he's getting the job done. Period. Just not right. I mean, you saw yesterday late in the game they go on that nice drive. It's like where was this? Where was this earlier in the game? Why aren't you getting into Trey Tucker? Why now? Look, I was okay. Obviously, get into Brock Bowers a lot early. Had a great game. He's your best weapon. You got to use him. No question. But the mixture of plays and the play calling 
suddenly you're way behind and you want to start to, well, not way behind, but you're behind. You want to start call, bringing out the creativity and taking risk and all that. You got to do that up from the beginning. So I, I just think that we all know that Luke Getze, no matter what happens with Antonio Pierce, because that's going to be decided after the year, nobody should get fired now. But I do think Luke Getze might not be here through the whole season. I I, I fought against that earlier because I don't think there's anybody behind him to take his place really of any kind of uh, value but it might get to the point so bad that they just need to do something. And I think we're there now, Mo, but I don't know what Antonio Pierce does next at quarterback. We talked about Carter Bradley. Some of these things, it, this black hole at the quarterback situation, look, you're not going to be a playoff team like you said, right? So just play Carter Bradley or whoever you bring in, and then Aiden O'Connell gets back. If he can play a few games at the end of the season, great. If not, you just you know let him sit. But to me, it's just like you just got to work on the development of young players. Keep feeding the ball to Brock Bowers. Let Jackson Powers Johnson play, make his mistakes, learn. And same with DJ Glaze. We saw a bunch of stuff from him yesterday or Sunday. So, so that to me is where they have to be at, right? It's developmental mode. I yeah. said, I said it said from this point yeah. forward at, at two and five. You're you're at a point now where you're just playing young players or guys who could fill spots and be depth next year because if you're looking at it from a long-term perspective you mm -hmm. want to develop some of your young guys so that when you have your starters next year the guys that play this year now can serve as quality depth next year so you're you're thinking two steps ahead right, right. so you, i'm not that's just, this is why i'm not bringing in a veteran quarterback i'm not bringing in brian Tannehill. i'm not doing it because it, brian Tannehill is not going to help me or help my team beyond no. 2024 and if you're a Raider team that's looking at a draft pick, I'm not saying tank, but it's a it's a it's a gentle way of saying tank. Yes. But if you're looking at a high draft pick, why would you want to bring in a veteran quarterback who's not going to be part of your future? It's all about no. two, three years down the line, not about this season. Right. The ship has sailed. You're not going to make the playoffs. You're two, you're two and five with no sign that you're coming out of it. You know what I'm saying? And you got the Chiefs uh, followed by the Bengals on the road the next week. So it's. It's getting rougher. It's not getting easier. You're not playing the Rams and some of these other teams. You, you're you going to play some more quality teams, and um, that has just a recipe for disaster. So if it's going to be that way, you're right. Just play the younger guys. All right, we're going to step aside for our first break here on the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black Today, an Aussie Sports Original Podcast with Mo and Scott. When we come back, we'll get more into what's ahead for the Raiders as they look to find guys who want to wear the silver and black moving forward and those that they maybe want to say goodbye to after the end of the year and uh, rebuild in some areas and try to get better very quickly, which I think they can do. So we'll talk about that when we come back again, silver and black today video brought to you by our good friends at bet us. Hey everybody. Welcome back silver and black today. Mo and Scott with you. Don't forget subscribe rate and review wherever you get your audio. We appreciate that very much. Even if you watch us, and again, the video brought to you by our good friends at BetUS, where you can get 150% sign-up bonus up to $2,000 by using the code YouTube150. That's YouTube150. So do that for us, our great friends at BetUS. Okay, Mo, we were talking about the coaching thing, and I'm not trying to, to kick the dead horse here, but the coaching question standing up, I saw a lot of people talking about, who's the guy who does the game management for the Raiders? And of course they publish his picture and he's like, okay, uh, this guy was the, the stats guy. And he was like a, uh, uh, a, a, whatchamacallit, um, like a special projects guy in the past. And so you look at that and you say, okay, well, that's the guy that'd be, yeah, you could Matt Sheldon is his name, right? 21 years in experience in the NFL, 20 years in coaching analytics and video in the NFL. So this guy has been around. He was the director of research and strategy for the Raiders for 22-23, and now he's overseeing game management. Okay, so you look at Matt Sheldon, it's easy to blame this guy, right? But at the end of the day, it goes back to the head coach too. But you look at this, clearly, I think, Mo, when you look at the offensive side of the ball, and this is where you talked about it earlier, the importance of getting the right guy. Look, Antonio Pierce, you, you delegate right? As a leader in that position, you have to delegate. So you delegate to people. And if those people don't do their jobs well, then it comes back to you, right? It's not that you did it or that it's, it's technically your fault, but you are 
are the people you've selected and you delegated to. Actually, around game management, we saw you know issues with the timeouts and and all the stuff throughout the course of this season. Um, I want to see that get better. Whether or not Antonio Pierce is the coach next year or not, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to address that until the end of the year. But if you look at it now, clearly things are not going well, even into these assistant and coordinator roles where you're counting on people to do certain things to make sure that this football team stays on track. How do you address that at this point in the season? You don't. You ride it out for the most part, unless something egregious happens. You're now, we're about halfway into the season. I don't think it helps necessarily to make drastic changes. I know after every loss, people want everyone fired. (laughs) But does it, you know, does it really help unless you have a Josh McDaniel situation where you've lost the locker room and your your players aren't, you know, all the way bought in? Then it's a different story. But as I said in the first segment, I don't think it's a buy-in issue. I don't think it's an effort issue. I I just think the Raiders are just a highly flawed, mistake-prone team talked about starts with the head coaching decisions some of them fourth quarter you look at uh not going for it on fourth down when you're nine yards away from the touchdown and you're going to need a touchdown regardless of what you do you talked mm-hmm. about that decision you talked about garner mint you turn the ball over four times a lot of it is on him you lose a turnover battle yes. <laughs> four to zero you're probably not going to win the football game it's a surprise it's a, the fact that the Rays are in that game it's surprising in itself, and it shows you how bad the – I don't say how bad the Rams are because they won the football game, but how depleted the Rams are without their top two wide receivers and a kind of a shaky offensive line. But there is a lot of blame to go around, right? Yeah. But you don't just fire everyone and make these midseason changes and hope that it gets better. You ride out the season, and then you reassess everything at the end of the season from the head coach down to the coordinators. Right, and I look at this, too, because the decision to start Gardner Minshew, right? Uh, We go back. That's usually a head coaching decision. But I remember when he named Gardner Minshew the quarterback, and his explanation was we thought it was better for him we get a fast start because they knew the schedule was easier at the beginning. And he mentioned then, you know, talking to Tom Telesco uh, and others and Champ and and all these, these guys in the front office, it sounded like it was like, hey, they agreed by committee which you know, I, I don't necessarily think is the right way to do it, but that's how they did it. And, and they chose wrong, right? So then he went to correct his mistake. So I give, I give Antonio Pierce credit for that. He went to, to Aiden O'Connell. Not that Aiden O'Connell was you know, at the top of the league in passing or something like that, but they, they made the choice. They went, so let's go with the younger guy. That might as well, right? And so what happened was uh, he gets hurt, right? That's not his fault either. So you can't control that. It's not Antonio Pierce didn't send a guy out there and he got hurt and that's his fault. That's not how it goes. But I do think that you look at decision-making again, and this goes back to what you think is the right thing to do. And, um, you know, do you choose a starting quarterback by committee or do you choose a starting quarterback based on your gut? And I don't know if Antonio Pierce did. I don't know if he felt like he had to go with these guys, if he really believed it. You know, he's a pretty independent, strong a uh, uh, guy who's confident. So I, I, I find it hard to believe that he would just, you know, s- turn it over to three people to choose a starting quarterback. But either way, you're right. You're in a position now. you got to deal with what you've decided on and, and what your roster is and just move forward with it. That's why I don't think people who are looking for a lot of change are going fi- are gonna to be happy because I don't think there's going to be a lot. No, I, I actually expect Gardner Minshew to start against the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I would say – the backup should be ready though, because if Gardner Minshew <laughs> throws two quick interceptions, he's probably going to be benched. Yeah, I mean, could, because you, I say this over and over again. As a quarterback, the easiest way to get benched or lose your job is to turn the football over, because that's why Gardner Minshew was benched in the first place. Right. The turnovers, and and now that Aiden O'Connell is not going to be available for a month, month and a half, you're looking at a turnover-prone veteran, who who who. Clearly, and Murph pointed this out a week or two ago, who clearly loses his confidence as he throws these interceptions. Yeah. Or you're looking at an undeveloped, maybe rookie, undrafted quarterback who doesn't have any regular season game experience. So it it, it the slim pickings here. Maybe the Raiders acquire if they're going to acquire a quarterback again. No Ryan Tannehill. No guys over no. three, four years old. If you're going to acquire a quarterback. At least acquire a young quarterback who's mobile. That's what yeah. I'm saying because the offensive line is still having its issues. If you're going to go out and get a quarterback, get, get a guy who can move back there. 
Yeah, I mean, you're going to get somebody like a Josh Do Dobbs. I mean, I know he's a little older, but you're going to get somebody like that who's on someone's practice squad is what you're going to get. Uh, so so don't think any, but any white horse guy on a white horse with a white hat is going to come in and rescue the Raiders' season because that's not going to happen. You just need somebody confident, hopefully, that doesn't turn the ball over. Even if they're not wildly successful, Mo, as long as they're not turning the ball over, meaning that the Raiders can stay in games because they're not spotting 20 points to the other team, thanks, Gardner Minshew, then then – at least you have that going for you, right? So you can let your defense. The issue, though, with the defense, real quick before we go on this one, is um, the defense has been playing great on some levels. On other levels, it doesn't create turnovers, right? It, and that's a problem because the Raiders, because of their offense, they need better field position. They need, and so so the, the defense is not a finished product, but nobody thought it would be. So, so at least you have that, and I think that there's some things that need to address there. We saw Trayvon Merrick do really, really well as did Nate Hobbs, Jacorian Bennett. He had a couple little miscues here and there, but those guys are playing well. And so when you look at the positives, as we said last week, you got to look at these. You like to see those young defensive backs playing well as we head into this uh, next stretch of tough games, Mo. The defense is going to offer resistance. And that's and by the way, that's without two of their two, three top pass rushers, yes. like Christian Wilkins and Michael Koontz. So the defense is playing well overall if you look at it if you look at it from a macro perspective but this team is it's built for a game where they're not going to turn the ball over they're going to keep it close defense is, is going to allow a bunch of explosive plays but the offense has to protect the football if the raiders don't turn the ball over they have a chance they they could have won that game on sunday yeah. and they will have chances as long as they don't allow the other team to score more than 24 points they have they have a shot, but but also Antonio Pierce has to at some point. I know he loves his defense, trusts his defense, but at some point he has to put some trust in his offense to score six points. Amen. Real quick before we go to the break, Mo, and then we get to everybody's call on the Raider Nation mailbag. Um, Mark Davis, you talked about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, owners are fine with coaches making mistakes and kind of growing into the job, but Mark, you know, once you start getting to the point where the owner gets embarrassed. Uh, a lot. I don't, you know, that's, that's usually not good for your longevity. I don't think we're there, although I think it's getting, it's starting to build. And then now you got this chiefs game. If, if the Raiders get blown out against the chiefs and I don't know that they will, because like you said, the defense is playing really well. Uh, at what stage does Mark Davis start getting more involved here and basically issuing the, the kind of, Hey, I need to see something more out of you guys, or we're going to have to make a change. I think after post buy, you start to look at it from that perspective and say, if the Raiders are still getting blown out, because the schedule is going to get tougher. You talked about yeah. the Chiefs, you talked about the Bengals, the, the Dolphins look like they're going to have two were back by the time they play the Dolphins in Miami mid November. You got the Chiefs again on Black Friday. You still have to play the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Falcons who are vying for the NFC South title. So it's getting tougher as the weeks go by. And if you're not competitive, I'm not expecting the Raiders to win any of those games. But if you're not competitive and there's some quit on the field, and there's no quit right now. No, you're not I seeing agree. quit right now. But if you start to see quit on the field, that's the first sign that your head coach is going to get canned. Okay. Well, there you go. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Nobody wants that to happen. So we'll see how it all unfolds. All right. We're going to take our final break. When we come back to the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black today, we're going to get to your calls. I'm sure they're great uh, on the Raider Nation mailbag with Mo and Scott here, Silver and Black today at Odyssey Sports original podcast. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And again, a shout out to our good friends at BetUS for bringing the video to all of you. We're coming right back. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from you. Any Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. That, that, that black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right, as you can imagine, lots of calls. And a reminder, make sure you leave your name. I had a couple calls. I don't know your name. I'm going to play one today. Uh, and we'll play the other ones. I just make sure you leave your name. Some of you guys, I recognize the voice. I can't always connect the name because we have some callers who call in obviously a lot. But uh, make sure you leave your name at the beginning so we know who you are. Uh, and Mo, we got we got our first three calls today, all from Oakland, the home, the birthplace 
of the Raiders. And first call we're going out is Michelle. Oh, by the way, video brought to you by our good friends at BetUS here on Silver and Black today. Make sure you check out the 150% sign-up bonus. That's right. Go to BetUS. Use the promo code YouTube150, and they will give you 150% sign-up bonus up to $2,000 thanks to the folks at BetUS. All right, here is our first call. We'll see how we're doing here, with how everybody's feeling out there. This is Michelle up in Oakland. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. It's Michelle calling from the East Bay in California. Um, it's going into halftime, and our offense is definitely scoring. Um, however, they're scoring points for the opposite team at this point. Um, it's just Minshew Min is like an absolute liability. I am continuing to see what I've heard talked about for the last few weeks on this podcast is the plays are continuously being called that develop behind the line of scrimmage. It's just a, it's a disaster. And at this point, if Aiden misses some serious time, I just don't see how, I just don't see how the rest of the team doesn't feel like hanging up their cleats. It's, it's not even halfway through the season. Um, Getsy at this point, and I want to see what happens at halftime, whether he gets sent to the booth or what happens. <laughs> if Getsy's still there, or he's still play calling next week. I'm seriously questioning AP at this point. Mm. Um, and I think they need to look into what options they have at quarterback. Cause if something were to also then happen to Minshew, then what? And I've been thinking about this in context with the draft class, uh, looking ahead to 25 and just being a little underwhelmed by it. But uh, would we consider a call to Bryce Young at any point. Um, I know that's a big if, and I think it's also really contingent on what coaching staff looks like next year since his current situation has clearly failed him. Um, but just some food for thought. Um, going to try not to break anything for the second half of this game. <laughs> Thanks for doing what you guys do. All right. There's Michelle from the East Bay. Thank you, Michelle. We appreciate you calling in. Make sure you call in again as well so it's not always a sausage factory on here it's nice to nice to hear from <laughs> nice to hear from an intelligent lady who follows the raiders right we have we have many of them out there they they don't necessarily call in but uh uh that was great uh, mo i'll let you start with that start with the last part piece there we talked about it in the previous segment about what the raiders do now uh but she asked about i've had a bunch of people say oh we should call carolina about bryce young what do you think of that yeah so the bryce young uh scenario is I, I've been asked about this a lot, right? So I'll start here. The Carolina Panthers, I'm not saying they're gonna ask for a lot, but if you're the Raiders, it all depends on what what the Panthers want for Bryce Young. So if they want more than a, a third round or more, I'm not doing it because I want that third rounder to be my running back or wide receiver mm -hmm. pick. I know they're probably gonna get a third rounder from the Jets, an extra one. But I want to invest those picks into players that are going to play next year around my quarterback versus a guy who is going to compete with the quarterback. Because if you look at it from this perspective, right, Bryce Young still has multiple years left on his deal. Remember that. So if you're bringing him in, he's going to be competition for whoever you draft a quarterback. So now you're going to have a guy who you gave up maybe a third round pick for depending on what the Panthers are asking for, competing with a guy that you assume is going to eventually be your starter, assuming the Raiders have a top five draft pick, and they will, because they're not going anywhere anytime soon, they're going to have a top quarterback prospect. Mm -hmm. And if you're setting that guy up to start, then what happens to Bryce Young, unless you're hoping to flip him later on for another pick? So if the price is cheap for Bryce Young, if it's below a fourth rounder, I take a shot. Why not? Sure. Because yeah. it, it can't hurt to bring in competition. Look at what the Minnesota Vikings have done. They right. did draft J.J. McCarthy. Unfortunately, he gets hurt. But they have Sam, Sam Donald there. Now, this isn't a veteran situation. But you also want to have multiple options at the quarterback position. I'm tired of seeing the Raiders and with a quarterback position situation where, okay, one guy goes down and now you're you're done for the season because the next guy is, a, is a, like a third stringer. Right. So the quarterback competition is, would be good for the Raiders, but you ha also have to be mindful what the price is. Price is. If it's less than a fourth, fine. If it's higher than a fourth, 
then I pass on it. Yeah, well put. And I, I think that <clears throat> the situation, I, there's no doubt Carolina will move Bryce Young, I believe. Uh, but I think it's more likely to happen in the offseason. It's more likely to happen with a team that has a veteran starter who's doing well or it might be at the end of the rope. I mean, look at the Rams. I know they have what's his face from Georgia there, but but you know, a team like that is more likely going to bring in a developmental quarterback, especially if they can get him for a fourth or fifth round pick or whatever at the time in the offseason. And Carolina's going to be one or two in the draft. So they're going to take another quarterback. Go ahead, Mark. Really, really quick. And typically when you when you're the Raiders and you're probably going to draft a quarterback, you want him to be paired with a veteran quarterback who he can learn from. So Correct. That rookie quarterback that the Raiders draft isn't going to be able to learn from Bryce Young, who has to figure himself out in this league right now. So yep. you're probably not bringing in a Bryce Young unless you really feel like he's got a shot to be your franchise quarterback going forward. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for the call, Michelle. Now we go to Luis in Oakland. Here's Luis. Scott, Mo. This is uh, Luis calling out of Oakland. Well, another bad loss by the Raiders. I just can't believe it, Mo and Scott. This team looks like they don't want to play anymore. I just don't understand it. To me, it looks like they're trying to lose the game. <laughs> I just don't know what to say anymore. Uh, this team really, really sucks. Well, I guess we got to be looking forward to the draft. Uh, quick question for you guys. Uh, do you think we have a chance at getting Ben Johnson from the Detroit Lions as the head coach next year? Because AP looks scared on the sidelines. <laughs> uh, I just got to finish watching the Rams, and I got to tell you, I mean, he looks lost out there. He, you got him. He's smiling on on a third down play that. I mean, oh, my God, it should have been a touchdown by Brock Bowers. It meant you could have threw it just a little bit tighter. But, as you know, the Raiders always lose at the end. Well, Scott and Mo, <laughs> you guys do a great job. And uh, go Raiders. All right, Luis in Oakland, thanks for the call, my man. We appreciate that very much. I, I know a lot of people put a stock into kind of body language, facial expressions of coaches when things aren't going well or when they're going well. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe Antonio Pierce is just a positive thinker. I, and, and I'm not making a joke there. I mean, really, I don't know. I guess we all, as, as, when we're fans of a sport, if the team's not doing well and things are going bad and you're feeling like this, you want your coach to feel that way too. Uh, but 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 when you look at when you talk about what Luis was expressing there, Mo, is there anything to that you think? I would. I don't know Antonio Pierce, so I wouldn't read anything to it. So I think it's unfair yeah. for me to do that because I don't know him as a person or what his mannerisms are. Mm -hmm. I will address the Ben Johnson uh, comment that he made, and mm -hmm. I will say Raider fans are all in on Ben Johnson. I understand that, but you do understand Ben Johnson is going to have multiple offers. Right. The Raiders have to be an attractive spot for him uh, to want to take over that team. Is he going to want to take over the Raiders as a head coach? Because other teams are going to be calling. He's going to be interviewing for probably at least eight teams. Yeah. And if the Raiders don't have the number one pick, whatever team has the number one pick, and if they're able and if they need a quarterback, I would assume that Ben Johnson is going to have that team high on his list because he's going to say, I can go to a team and handpick my quarterback. I'm going to be the head coach and play caller. I get to pick who I want as the quarterback of my football team versus a team that's going to pick sixth or seventh, and I don't know exactly who's going to be there for me. So yeah. just keep that in mind uh, when you talk about Ben Johnson and the opportunity he's going to have next offseason. Well, and you look at it, too. By the way, uh, a little self-promotion here, but uh, Sports Not, uh, every two weeks we we release the the heat meter, right, which is like coaches that are, all, you know, their seats are getting hot, which Antonio Pierce is actually on that list uh, from Sports Not. But you look at Doug Peterson, right, so Jacksonville, Dennis Allen in New Orleans, Mike McCarthy in Dallas, Nick Sirianni in Philadelphia. That's four jobs right there, and there'll be more. But that's four jobs, and you look at some of those jobs, whether you think Trevor Lawrence is going to make it or not, he's an established quarterback. He's going to be there. He's not going anywhere. 
You also have uh, uh, the situation in New Orleans with Derek Carr. They have two young quarterbacks beneath him. You have Mike McCarthy in Dallas and the Cowboys and the kind of money they have. And then, of course, Nick Sirianni with the Eagles. The Eagles, even though they're having to retool and they're struggling a little bit, they, they still have a lot of talent there. So it's not just as easy as saying, hey, we want this guy. We're going to go get him. Uh, because there's a lot of competition, but but I, I understand that he's one of those hot names, and we'll see what happens. But let's let's hope Antonio Pierce puts it together and can get an offensive coordinator next year and keeps his job. If he doesn't, he doesn't, and then you have to start thinking about the coaching situation. But thanks for the call, Luis. We appreciate it. All right, we're staying in Oakland. We're going to our buddy Anders. Here's Anders. Hi, fellas. Uh, Anders from Oakland. A couple of weeks ago, I said that Gardner Minshew should never see the field in <laughs> any way, shape, or form ever again. He did. I stand by that statement uh, proudly. Kudos. Second thing is I want to talk about Antonio Pierce real quick. I think that there are all sorts of issues. Obviously, we can look at that. But I think the biggest thing is the boneheaded decisions um, that are, whether it's clock management or – it's not going for it on fourth and two. And the, the reason it's so bad, to, in my opinion, is that it sends a terrible signal to the team. And the team, well, the players were pretty quickly come to the realization that this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And as soon as you th- feel that about your boss, it's over. You know, Scott, you always talk about, like, working in business. Business leaders, their primary responsibilities are – to set the vision for the company, and to make decisions. Mm -hmm. That's really what they do and hire good people. And he can't do either. We don't have an identity for this team at all. He has 400 coaches, which just diffuses the leadership of the team, and he makes terrible decisions. That's a problem. That's when players quit on coaches. Now, if he made the right decisions and the players didn't step up, it would be easier to do this, but he's not. He's making terrible decisions. My two cents. Hope, love to hear what you guys think about that. Bye now. All right, Anders in Oakland. Thanks for the call, man. Mo, I'll ask you this. Uh, you, we, because we've talked about it all season about some of these decision making issues and time management issues and whatnot. Uh, for you, on a scale of one to ten, one being uh, great decision making and ten being terrible decision making. Where is Anto- for, for through seven games? Where is he at on that scale of one to ten? I would say I would I would have put it at about seven eight simple because we talked about the inconsistencies on fourth down the mm-hmm. the it's it started with the charges I would go at eight you, yeah. it started with the charges on the fourth down calls you know going for it on fourth down on the opponent's side of the field but not going for it on your side of the field and we had the most recent uh, scenario where as I said. Regardless of the outcome on that fourth down play, the Raiders have to score a touchdown. Whether you try to do it now while you're down eight or you kick the field goal and you're down five, you're going to need a touchdown. And even if you say the offense sucked for most of the game, so that's why he didn't trust his offense, as I said, you're eventually going to have to trust that offense to score a touchdown. So why not go for it when you're much closer in, in the red zone Versus saying, "Hey, we'll we'll you know we'll kick the field goal and try to stop the Rams and get the ball at the fifty and try to drive fifty yards downfield." It's situational football, and we talked and we as a matter, matter of fact, I said we talked about this in week one. We talked about this in the preseason. Remember yes, when Antonio Pierce burned his timeouts and allowed the Vikings to score? And a lot of people said, "Well, at least he gets this out of the way in the preseason. And these games don't count, right?" <laughs> Here we are in week yeah. seven, and we're still having game management issues. And I and I hear that people want to bring want to want to blame Sheldon, who's you know who's supposed to be in charge of that. Antonio Pierce is the head coach, as Anders says, he's supposed to set the table. He's supposed to set the vision. Antonio Pierce has the executive decision. He has the button on his desk. So it starts with him. And when you talk about turnovers and penalties, that's not a decision making problem, but still a reflection of the head coach and the coaching staff. All right, there you go. Again, Anders, thanks for the call, man. Now we go to Pastor Mike behind bars. Let's see if he's uh, – hopefully he's he's keeping an le- a even keel because, you know, he's he's ministering to people, so you don't want him to be too down. Here's Pastor Mike. Scott Moe, Pastor Mike behind bars. I'm actually driving through the beautiful Columbia River Gorge this afternoon, this nice. evening, this fine day after watching the Raiders <laughs> completely take a dump in L.A. Uh, <laughs> They showed some fight. I will say that. 
Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if you answer it. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, I don't know if AP is is hit. And do you move on? And just Scott, you talked about in the post game a little bit. Do you move on? You know, right away. Because the problem is we're gonna have, we're gonna have a high pick next year. Do we trust this staff to develop that young quarterback if we get that quarterback? That's really the question. So that's the question I pose to you guys. Is it? I mean, we got to get it right. I, I, I trust that Brady Seymour and Colt mm-hmm. Mark Davis um, make some decisions and maybe hire the right guy and, and then, you know, and then draft the right person. Maybe Telesco can pick out the right guy, <laughs> although I think he picked Brandon Staley, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. And Van Joseph. Just throwing that out there, um, going to the game this weekend. This next weekend, um, road trip with my daughter. It'll be fun, and I'm praying for a trap game. All right, have a good one, guys. Raiders. <laughs> All right, there's Pastor Mike behind bars. Mo, this is the question you posed on X. I think it was on mm-hmm. uh, Monday where you uh-huh. said, would you trust the staff with a young quarterback? And that's where I think that if, if – that the and I said this a couple weeks ago – that the Hill, they gave Antonio Pierce the job, and he knew he had to do really well to maintain it, as anybody does when they have a job. And that Hill just continues to get bigger, and he keeps sliding down it for lots of reasons, as we talked about. But to me, then you start to look at the future. The future and what the Raiders have to do as well does not favor the current coach because they're going to sit down and they're going to evaluate with whoever it is, if it's Tom Brady now and Richard Seymour and some other people, and they're going to say, okay, we have the fourth pick in the draft. Let's say that's what it is. Uh, We're going to get a quarterback. We might even be able to move up and get whoever the hell we want at number one. Who knows? But if that's the case... Do we bring somebody in, see how it works out, make him get a new offensive coordinator and hope that it works? Or do we say, you know what, we're going to clean the slate, we're going to go get who we want, and we're going to bring a package of a head coach and an OC that we know can develop quarterbacks or at least think they can. Um, and that's what makes it difficult, I think, for Antonio Pierce to to Pastor Mike's point. I'll say this. I, I have no idea or no clue whether I trust in Tony Pierce or not because I don't know who's on his short list of head, of offensive coordinator candidates. So without knowing who's on his list, if if, if he was faced with the decision of look, you gotta if you want to keep your job AP, you gotta fire your OC and bring in another one. Without knowing who's on that list, I will say he hasn't earned my trust yet. Mm-hmm. If you look at the offensive staff, right, you got some experienced guys you mentioned Scott Turner, Joe Philbin, I didn't like the hire of Luke Getzey from day one. And a lot of people will say, well, he had Cliff Kingsbury and Cliff Kingsbury bailed. That's not his fault. Alex Van Pelt, I believe, was still available. I preferred Alex Van Pelt over Luke Getzey. By the way, Drake May is playing pretty well in New England. Now, New England hasn't won in any of his starts. But that's because of the defense. The defense has right. allowed 73 Terrible points defense. in the last two weeks for the Patriots. Drake May is playing well under Alex Van Pelt. I had Alex Van Pelt third on my list of OCs preferable. I didn't have Luke Getzey on my list at all, period. The other point I want to make, Scott, about Antonio Pierce and his his decisions that he's going to have to probably make because I don't see Luke Getzey making out of the season, but he hasn't earned my trust yet with Rich Gangarello, Luke Getzey, uh, you, Joe Philbin, and eh, Scott Turner, and eh. If those guys aren't better than Luke Getzey at calling plays, then you look at this offensive coaching staff from a total and you say, it's not a good staff. No. So how can you trust AP to bring in a staff to right. help develop that rookie quarterback that you're going to bring in in 2025? Yep. No, I agree with you 100%. Okay. Listen, we're out of time. We have more calls. We will get to them. We'll do an extra session on Thursday. So we have some calls that we're going to bring over from the weekend because there's some good stuff, including some folks like some new callers. We have, of course, Tarek, our, our guy who always calls in, but then we also have Steven from Texas we have left a great message. So don't, don't think we're not going to get your call on because we will, uh, but we got, we got to run today. So we'll do that. But thank you to everybody again, 702-900-7869. Leave your name and where you're calling from. Make sure you do that right at the beginning that way we'll use your calls because we know who we're talking to. We just want to make sure uh, that you get the credit for your call, but also so that we can get to know you a little better. So thank you for that. Uh, Mo, uh, before we check out of here on this Tuesday, let everybody know what you got come up in the next few days so they can keep track of your lovely face on television. 
Sports night. I'll have a pizza, a pizza up uh, talking about trade moves that the Raiders could make, either incoming or outgoing moves. A lot of buzz out, out there. I know a lot of people are even talking about Max Crosby. You know where I stand on that. If you don't, read the piece and you'll find out. On Wednesday, a little change up in the TNT Sports schedule. Uh-oh. I will be on TNT Sports Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific. We're switching it up because World Series Baseball is taking precedence on Thursday. Yankees and Dodgers, of course. Uh, Bleach Report live on Wednesday, same time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. We'll be back. Or we'll be here on, on Silver Black today, of course. And then the post game, Chiefs Raiders on Sunday, right after over on Bleach Report. Yes. So uh, lots of stuff coming up. Uh, make sure you, again, call in if you want to text. We have some text messages we'll get to you in the next show as well. So don't think we forgot about you, but we certainly appreciate you being part of it. Mo, my friend, I will see you Thursday. Take care, Scott. Take care, Raider Nation. All right. For our producer, Mike Rabier at Odyssey, and for Momo, and I'm Scott Colbranson. This has been Silver and Black today. Thanks for being with us today. And also, thanks to our good friends at BetUS for bringing you this video. Again, 150% sign-up bonus up to $2,000. Use the code YouTube150. Again, that is YouTube150. Get that free money and go in and figure out what you're going to do coming up this weekend, Thursday night. Football's coming up. Of course, you got college football and, of course, a Sunday. All right? We will see you again Thursday. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio, and don't forget to rate and review. From Amotin, Scott Branson here. We'll talk to you next time, Raider Nation. Take care.